Yes, yes, yes. A bummer, Spike Lee. Uh, first time Kobe doing work at King Chapel and Morehouse College. I rush up to her, says, Spike, I would love to have an internship with you. He said, hey, send me a resume. Here's my email. Having her squat. Next semester, he comes back um, to Atlanta. He does a sh- um, shows a short film, Jesus Children of America, at Clark Atlanta University. Bum rushed him right after. Says, Spike, you know, it's my second time asking for an internship. Would you mind, you know, I get your contact and whatnot. So, yeah, here's my email. Send me your resume. Still haven't heard shit. Third time's a charm, maybe, right? You're listening to Creative Breakthrough, the podcast that provides you with the strategies to elevate your creative passion to the next level. I'm your host, creative hustler, and chicken wing lover, Shireen Kassam, a.k.a. The Funny Brown Girl. And yes, I have an unhealthy obsession with chicken wings. Now, get ready to flex your creative muscle and keep winning. Is your mind always running? Do you struggle focusing? Do you have a hard time turning off after your 9 to 5 to focus on your creative passion? Well, then I may have an answer for you. CBD. CBD is an active ingredient in cannabis derived from the hemp plant. But unlike its cousin marijuana, it doesn't give you the psychotic high. And it's legal in most places, including the United States. Since I introduced CBD into my daily life, I've felt less anxious and more creative. It's helped me sleep better, be more relaxed, and most of all, it's helped me turn off after a stressful day and focus on my creative hustles. If you want to learn more, check out HoorayForCBD.com and use the code PODCAST to save 10% on your first purchase. Again, that's HoorayForCBD.com and promo code PODCAST to save 10% off any CBD purchase. Hey, 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 welcome back to another episode of The Creative Breakthrough. Hey, I am so grateful to all of you for tuning in again to season two. Season two, episode one did amazing. And I was so shocked how many of you guys remember that I existed and came back and listened and shared with your friends. So thank you so much. Hey, this episode, I am going to dedicate to Matt. Matt is my boyfriend and we met a few years ago on the radio. It was a, it was like a ratings gig. It was mostly for ratings. We did a dating game to help me find a boyfriend because I was really struggling in that space. And I ended up meeting Matt, who was totally different from me. And we are still together to this day. But I dedicate this episode to him because he is the one who finally got me off of my ass and got me making a podcast. And I say that because if you've been listening from the beginning, you've heard the story. I wanted to make a podcast in 2014. And I just kept dragging my feet. I just wasn't doing it. Uh, the years kept going by. In 2017, I finally bought a Zoom recorder and we went to Africa and I took the Zoom recorder with me to Africa with two mics because I wanted to do like this un- anthology documentation thing where I was going to talk to family members about how we came to Africa and then how our family left to go to different parts of the world like Europe, Canada, United States, and then that didn't work. And so when I came back to the United States in 2018, I literally walked everywhere with a Zoom recorder in my backpack just waiting for that story. What was I going to do my podcast on? But as I kept thinking about what I wanted to do my podcast about, it just kept coming back to me that I wanted to focus this podcast on spotlighting creatives of color in the arts, in creativity, in business, in entertainment, and really just learning from them. What are the strategies to win? But the more research I did and the more people I talked to, people were like, no, Shireen, it's not going to work. It's such a small niche. You're not going to get enough listeners. People aren't interested in that topic. You need to go broader. And Matt was like, listen, you've been toying with this idea for ages at this point. You just keep wanting to talk about this. So go talk about it. Go do it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You could always change it up later. You can always tweak it, rebrand it, whatever you need to do. But you've got to get started. So almost a year ago now... It'll be a year in two weeks. I started Creative Breakthrough and we are now in season two. And I am so grateful for all of you for continuing to tune in, for sharing these episodes, for subscribing. And I'm so appreciative because I didn't think that this podcast would do as well as it's doing right now. And that's all because of you guys. So thank you. Hey, this week we have such an awesome guest on the show. 
I met this young man two years ago at the American Black Film Festival, and you guys hear me talk about the American Black Film Festival, also known as ABFF, a lot. And if you ever have the chance to go, either as a competitor competitor or as a guest, I highly recommend it. Um, they do a lot of competitions leading up to the festival in the summer. They do competitions for comedy, for short film, for TV writing, for hosting, for acting. So definitely get those applications in. And I usually mention them on this podcast when those applications open up. I also put them in my bi-weekly newsletter. So make sure you subscribe at funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. I met this young man two years ago, as I mentioned, at ABFF. I was competing in the HBO comedy competition, and he was competing in the HBO short film competition. Brooklyn-born, Long Island-bred Stefan Bristol is writing his own success story as a fresh face with a creative voice in the indie film world. Stefan is an award-winning filmmaker who just released his first feature film, See You Yesterday, which was released on Netflix in May 2019. And since then, he has been walking red carpets, he has been hosting panels, and he has just been shining. And he is going to shine for a very long time, y'all. As a recent alum of NYU's graduate film program, Stefan helmed many films, including the Cine Golden Eagle Award winner, The Bodega. Spike Lee, a longtime mentor, awarded Stefan with the 2016 Spike Lee Production Grant for his short thesis film, See You Yesterday, which the feature film currently out right now is based on. The short is currently streaming on Cinemax's online platform, Max Go. Stefan has also co-directed the upcoming television series Payroll with Dennis Williams and directed a proof of concept for Chad Sanders' The Archer Connection, the upcoming BET television series. Some of Stefan's favorite films are Back to the Future and Jurassic Park. He says, don't judge him. Hey, so what are we waiting for? Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the guest chair, Stefan. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, it's a pleasure. This is exciting. I am um, humbled, honored and and good to good to uh, talk to you. Two no, years. I know it's so much has <laughs> changed in two years. I can't wait to hear what you've been up to. I mean, I've seen it all over the news, but to hear it from oh, you. God. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> I hope it's nothing but good things to hear from the news. Yes. Oh, my God. Everywhere I look, there's your face smiling with Spike Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I was like i'm glad he said no the first time i asked him because now now i can ask him and now it's like <laughs> now the podcast can be worth something <laughs> Hilarious. so you know i love starting i love asking my guests this question so i'd love to ask you when did your creative journey begin when oh my creative journey i've always been a creative honestly when even when i was a little kid uh when i was like you know, five, six, seven, maybe. I, I always loved to draw. Um, I used to draw Disney, you know, characters and whatnot. And um, I, you know, even when I was like a little kid, I used to write short stories. And I shared with my parents and whatnot. And it just, I just happened to stop, you know, being an artist or, you know, from being, from drawing into writing the short stories because, you know, I, I was born and raised in Brooklyn. So in Brooklyn, I was distracted by trying to be popular in school or whatnot, trying to get the girls all, all that, all that nonsense. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I grew up, it's, it's funny. It's like, you know, I grew up watching a lot of television, anime, cartoons, movies. You know, I had Jurassic Park on repeat. I used to, we used to have, and this is something I wish like, you know, streaming services have is like uh, the director's commentary and, and, and uh, behind the scenes stuff. They don't have that. I'm so pissed off. They don't have that because when I was growing up, I used to listen to that stuff, and I was curious to know how 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 filmmakers make films, and they would tell you in this director's commentary. So, like when Jurassic Park special edition DVD set came out, I, I that's all I listened to was the you know the social commentary. You know, you know Steven Spielberg and the cast talk about how to make Jurassic Park, and I you know I watched all the the documentary behind the scenes. Um, you know, so that contributed to my creative process and whatnot. Uh, a friend of mine had a camera; he wanted one of me and my, my, you know, friends, I was like 10, 11 years old at the time. And they wanted to, um, you know, do a gangster film. Like was going to get all these little toy guns and, and get funny suits and, you know, trying to do those, you know, 1930s prohibition era gangster films in Coney Island. <laughs> <laughs> 
And but you know, we was you know, we actually got the guns, we actually got some funny suits, and it was about to shoot it until you know my friend said, you know, he got into a fight and his camera got stolen. And, oh, no. and yeah, that's always oh, sucked. And it was it's then I was like, you know, filmmaking is very interesting. I was thought like, you know, maybe maybe one day I'll be a film director. But I wasn't one until I was 18 years old when I, you know, I saw Do the Right Thing for the first time. And I told my I and when I finished watching that film, I rushed downstairs. This is by the time I, you know, moved to Long Island, and Long Island's boring as shit, and, and it was terrible. Don't move to Long Island. And <laughs> I, I, I was watching do, do the Right Thing when, and I was just completely at awe of how how amazing that movie is, how how it resonated with me as 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 a black man coming from Brooklyn, and how so much it, you know, it's like man, I miss Brooklyn, I miss, you know, my culture there, and I just watched Do the Right Thing, and that's rushed out said to my mom said ma i know what i want to be i want to be a filmmaker and she wasn't having it you know she was she's a guyanese woman conservative um you know she wanted me to get a more stable job and whatnot but right the immigrant dream right <laughs> yeah yeah the immigrant dream but you know i so i said okay you know i you know bow down unfortunately and and I went to study, went to community college to study, uh, what you call that, it, uh, education. Thought I wanted to be a teacher. Um, and that wasn't for me. Um, no way. And I said, you know what, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to go to, uh, I, I need to get away from my parents. I need to get away from, I need to go far away. So I decided to go to, go to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. And for those who are listening, Morehouse College is the best college in the United States of America. Don't you forget. <laughs> and I went there and, you know, I woke up one morning and I said, you know what? I'm going to be a film director. This is what I want to do. And, and that was Morehouse, Morehouse known for film school, like film directors, or was that, was it two separate decisions? Uh-uh. Uh, that's two, two separate decisions. Morehouse, like when I went to Morehouse, I just, I just needed to go to HBCU. So I know what it means to be black in America. Got it. And just a side note, what I learned about being black in America is that you would never learn exactly what it is to be black in America <laughs> because black people are very, 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 very diverse. We come from so many social and economic backgrounds, so many ethnicities and culture. Um, there's no definition, real strong definition of what it means to be black. And I am proud of learning that in a hard way and I'm proud of um, my institution. Um, so what I, I went there because I, I just want to know what it is to be black and I, and I was trying to, trying to figure out what to do in my life. I said, let me, let me study English because I like storytelling. Um, but I hate, hate, end up hating my major because I just wasn't into it. And I woke up one morning and said, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I always wanted to do. I'm going to be a filmmaker. And I tried to find a way to, um, have that be my major. But at the time, there is no, the major stopped for filmmaking in 1992. So I had to work my ass off to get into NYU. And one of the ways I got worked my ass off to get into NYU is I met Spike at, at, um, at Morehouse. Um, I went to a screening of Kobe's, Kobe doing work and I bum rushed Spike. I, <laughs> <laughs> I rushed up to Spike, you know, um, I'd love to have an internship with you. I'll try to be a filmmaker. You know, can I see my resume and whatnot? I said, yeah, send me your resume. Here's my email. Great. Well, that was haven't nice. Heard. He was, so, he, so he was like welcoming? No, I haven't heard shit from him. Oh. Because <laughs> I was going to say, when I bum rushed him at ABFF, he totally dismissed me. He was like, are you trying to talk to me, ma'am? I would suggest you move. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. He's, <laughs> this bike is quite a character. Um, yeah, he can be very abrasive sometimes <laughs> Putting, but <laughs> he, and the funny thing is, he knows about this too. Like he knows this about himself. Oh, so he's aware of it. That's good. Uh, That's yeah, good. you know, he's very aware, and he does it, and he does it habitually. <laughs> uh, and 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 I understand why. It's just like you know, you you try to protect your own self, and you can't mm -hmm. can't help everybody. And I've I've been to that position myself, like everybody contacting me and whatnot. Um, for help and advice, and it's like I, you know, I I only have so room for so much, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I, unfortunately, there every time I had to turn people away, not because I want to be facetious. It's just that I, I don't have the brand bandwidth. Um, and mm -hmm. some people get upset with that and they don't understand. 
So uh, how would you say, I, I want to, I don't want to stop your story about Spike Lee, but so caveat real quick, like you say, people come at you asking you for help and stuff. What, what is a good pitch to get you to help someone? Like, how do you decide who you're going to help and not help? Like how can I, can I, if, if a question is like, can I be in the next film? Can I, you know, I'm, I'm an actor, uh, you know, I'm trying to be in the next film. What, what can I do? It's like, I can't help you with that. You know what I'm saying? One, I don't, I don't know who you are. That's one and two. Yeah. I, you know, that's not how you, that's not how you get into a film. You audition. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, you go, you, first of all, you learn your craft. And if you learn your craft, you know that the best way for you to get into a film is not rush up to a bum, rush up to a director and ask them to be in your movie. That's not how right. it happens. <laughs> um, Has um, someone done that to you? I get this 24 seven. And I wish really? I, wow. The common folk who once again in the industry do not know the rules of this industry because this industry, this industry is very misty and murky. And I had to go to film mm-hmm. school to understand this, the, the industry um, and how it works. And I can't, I can't, I don't blame people for, you know, asking me to like, hey, I'm, a, I'm trying to be an actor, can I be in a movie? It's, 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 it's what I don't appreciate is, is people get upset when I turn them down. Yeah. So there's a process. Like people need to follow the rules. Like it's, it's do it the right way. Like they can make the connection with you and just put their name out there, but they need to be professional on how they approach it. Right, right. And it's not like I'm turning anyone away per se. It's more of like, okay, here's my, here, I, I, I'll say your question. Here's my answer. Um, you know, if you want to be an actor, you have to go to acting classes or acting school um, mm-hmm. because there's people who, who the, the best actors learn their craft to the team. And find out not just the craft, but find out who they are as a person and as an artist and figure out who they themselves can bring to the table that no other actor can do. And so it's it's almost like working out. It's like, how can I find my center? And that's that's, that's what it is. And and acting, you know, to be a filmmaker, you don't have to go to film school. But but I fundamentally, fundamentally believe to be an actor, you have to go to acting school. You know, yeah, it's, 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 it's not picking up a piece of paper, memorize your lines and just delivering them. It's just so much. It's like, it's, it's very, it's, it's so much psychology that goes behind being an actor. Mm-hmm. So you said film school wasn't necessary. So did you feel like you needed it or did now that you've gone through it, you feel like you didn't need it? Personally, I needed it personally. I come from, like I lived in Long Island and, and I, you know, once once I had to finish undergrad, the only place I could live is back with my parents who was on Long Island. And I actually sought after production companies on Long Island where I could learn filmmaking. And most of these production companies are mostly videographers, you know, doing weddings and sports videos and whatnot. That's not what I do. I want to learn how to make a movie. Um, so the only thing I can do was go to film school. And I chose NYU, New York, and NYU Singapore, which is now defunct. Um, UC, um, USC, and um, as a very, very much of a backup plan, SCAD in Savannah, Georgia. I got into all four. Nice, and congrats. Thank you. And I chose New York because I, I, I've been back to NYU, to New York for such a long time. I miss, I miss my home. I miss my, miss my life. You know, my New New York City, Brooklyn, baby, is my love, my life, my everything. Yeah. So let's circle back. Okay. So you bum rush Spike Lee. That one yes. Happened. Yes. Yes. A bum rush Spike Lee. Uh, first time. Kobe doing work at King Chaplin and Morehouse College. I rush up to her. I said, Spike, I would love to have an internship with you. He said, hey, send me a resume. Here's my email. Having her squat. Next semester, he comes back um, to Atlanta he does a sh- um, shows a short film Jesus Children of America at Clark Atlanta University. Bum rushed him right after. Said Spike, you know it's my second time asking for an internship. Would you mind? You know I get your contact and whatnot. So yeah, here's my email. Send me your resume. Still haven't heard shit. Third time's a charm, maybe right? So this time, a good friend of mine, uh, he's, he's top Hollywood producer now. Dr. Stephen Love. He's not a real doctor, but we call him Dr. Love all the time. Um, and he started, he was trying to start a film program at Morehouse. So, you know, the dean invited Spike to come to Morehouse to, to have a chat with him. And the dean, you know, was explaining to him how Morehouse needs 
a phone program. You ask for his blessing. Space Spike, show you have my blessing. What can, how can I help? Can you, can you give us $4 million? Spike was like, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> At the table, I was like, how much you ask for this man? That was funny. And... Um, at, you know, at the meeting, I showed him one of my short films I did during my time at Morehouse. He really liked it or whatnot. And after the meeting, he was like, okay, got to go. And he gets, he shoots up and he's about to rush out and I bum rushed him again. And I was like, Spike, it's my third time asking for an internship. Hook a brother up. He said, third time, huh? Yes. Third time, man. All right. All right. Here, here's my email. Send me a resume. I was like, Jesus Christ. Here we go. But luckily, um, a week later, I got I got the internship. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So, how long has he been your mentor for now? Eight nine years. Awesome. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've I've uh, worked at his office not only as an intern but as an office PA twice. Um, and then during the time I was in development. And pitching it, pitching CES at the studios, I was uh, his what one of his assistants, personal assistants um, for Black Klansmen. Oh wow, that's awesome! Yeah, so I really get to see how how he worked behind the scenes on Black Klansmen. It was, it was so crazy. you were working for him while you were filming your own stuff. <clears throat> I was working for him while I was developing my the script. Got it. Okay. For CES okay. today, yeah. Okay. So what, like now you have this relationship with Spike or a mentorship. How do you like, what um, advice do you have for other people who find a mentor? Like how do you kind of like make that blossom and make it work for you and work for them and keep it mutual? First and foremost, no, that makes sense. First and foremost, be careful who you choose as a mentor. Cause there's a lot of people that I know personally that, Oh, he's my, she's my mentor. That's my mentor. That's my manager or whatever. And I'm like, well, okay, they're, that's great, but what, ha- what have they done? Because a lot of people out there that talk a good game, but what is their track record? I'm not saying, like, you know, you need a mentor like Spike Lee to make it to the business, but you need somebody with a substantial track record that can actually back the work up and actually help you get into the door. Mm-hmm. Now, and and how did you help- do that with Spike? Like, how did you transition that from working for him to making him a mentor that you trusted to help you? Well, first and foremost, I did not expect him to to come he came to me as he asked me to be my producer you know i was working on this i was working on the first draft of the script uh a couple of nights before christmas and he emailed me he said stuff i would love to i love to be your uh producer for um for for your feature film think about it oh, wow uh, and were you working for him at the time so he was aware of your project because um cds day was a short film first Mm-hmm. And that was my thesis film for NYU. Got and, it. Okay. And Spike was very much aware of what I was trying to do from from conception. And he gave me a grant for my short. And then he saw the short film, and he gave me another grant um, to finish the short. And by that time, uh, the film was in, in film festivals and the circuit and whatnot. Um, and he was just, you know, reading read every single draft of the script. So, so that's, that's how it happened. Um, it's, so, so it's, I was trying to figure out how, how to answer the question so the audience can. <laughs> um, it, it, I, I don't expect Spike to, I, I never came with the intention um, to, to work with Spike on this level that I had. It was mostly, I'll do, you know, I'll do all the work. I'll do all, like literally everything, like make the film. And all I wanted was to slap his name on it, saying he was the executive producer. That's what I was <laughs> expecting. And just give me some notes. You right. know what I'm saying? That's what I was expecting. I was not expecting him to fly me out to L.A. to meet with Hollywood executives to help me get an agent. Uh, because he, he saw something in me and he believed in me. I worked my ass off. Yeah. Um, and I, plus I had a product that he never seen something before. And and when I asked him to be my mentor, it was this is like... I actually my mentor, but I was make I was doing work for the for five years at film school. I wasn't like, hey, give me my mentor. Okay, here's a script that I want you to produce. That's not that's not how it works. When I asked to be a mentor, all I asked is was was can you give me notes and give me guidance on 
what's your advice on my next steps? Mm-hmm. That's all I wanted from him. It was like, and, and there was time I asked him for favors, of course, like, hey, can you, do, you, do you mind if I have a job at your office? You know what I'm saying? Like, because I needed, I was broke. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I wasn't expecting him to, um, to say, yeah, you know what I'm saying? And so, so you, so you slowly cultivated a relationship with him. It wasn't like you jumped in and then expected nah. a lot. It was a, it was like a mutual relationship that was building. Yes, exactly. It, it took nine years and wow. it's still growing. It wasn't like, it wasn't like, you know, yet last night it took mm-hmm. me three, it took me three semesters to ask him to be my mentor. Three semesters while I was at Morehouse. And five years just to build a relationship while I was at NYU. Showing up in his class, going to his advisement meetings, actually making work, show it, show showcase my work, you know, and just just be in his face all the time and just trying to learn. Yeah, and I love what you just said there. It's so important. Like a, a mentorship is a two-way street. So he was providing you feedback and advice and reading your scripts, but you were also put, putting in the work and providing him a good product, right? So yes, it, exactly. It, that's so important in building a mentorship relationship, which sometimes I think we forget when we when we look for a mentor. Right, exactly. You got to want it. Like, you know, you can't, there's not handouts. No one's going to give me a handout because everybody's mm-hmm. struggling to, to, you know, figure this out for themselves. You know, it's, it's not a handout. You know, work. <laughs> <laughs> work. What so I met you in 2017 in Miami at the American Black Film Festival. And I talk about the film festival a lot because I think for me, mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but I think ABFF is probably like the best, one of the best fil- film festivals or just festivals that I've ever been to, just the way it's organized, um, the creative they have there, the networking, the mentorship they have there. Um, that's where I met you. You had a short film. Uh, See you yesterday at that time was a short and you, pr- you premiered it there. Walk us through your journey since then. I mean, it's been two years and now you're on billboards, your films on billboards, it's on Netflix, but like it didn't happen overnight. Like, it's not like you came to ABFF and you won HBO. It's like, what did you have to do? But what have you been doing this last two years to get to where you are today? And I asked, and I sorry, and I asked that because I think people always think, oh, you just write a film and somebody buys it, and boom, there you go. But that's obviously not the case. <laughs> mm, no, that's not the case. But during the ABFF, uh, during the, I was just there to network at ABFF. Uh, you know, I didn't, I personally didn't give a shit about winning nothing. You know what I'm saying? And then the competition happened. People saw the films. People chewed my ears off. So you won, you won. You know, but thankfully, it hurt. It stung that I didn't win, but thankfully, I didn't win because that <laughs> gave me the drive to say, I got to make this motherfucking movie because I didn't win. Uh, so it was during that time I was I was in between drafts of working on CU yesterday, and, and, and Spike was flying me out to L.A. to meet with production companies and whatnot. And after, after you know, it was that was – ABFF was when – um June. So by the time August hit, um Spike said, Look, I can't concentrate on see you yesterday right now. I'm about to go to do Black Klansman. So I want you to come in and be my assistant. Be one of my assistants. We're working on working along with Lauren Owen, um, who's who was associate producer for, for See You Yesterday. And work along with her and 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 then, you know, after after which we're gonna continue. I was like, okay, cool. Um, so I stopped writing um, the script so I can make some money and just learn the craft of filmmaking. And then by December, uh, after all this is finished, Spike came to me and said, "I got you a deal with Netflix." Wow. I was I was like, what? 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 And like, because <laughs> before then, okay, let me rewind it. Before Black Klansman shoot, we flew to LA. We met with the executive at Netflix, and he said he's gonna read it. And it took so long to get back to us that, you know, Spike was like, he's taking too long. We'll get back to him whenever. And then, my, and then when December came, he said, I got your deal with Netflix. I said, okay, great. So what happened to this executive? He said, I'm not worried about him. I cut his head. I went straight to Ted Serrano's and, I, and we got you the money. I was like, wow, that's, that's endearing. Wow. So I'm lucky on that. But I flew back to L.A., had the pitch. Um, and the exec- there was two new executives there that to help me out with 
with the script. They gave me notes, but they didn't green light the project yet. So I was basically for from from January to um, May, I was basically, you know, developing the script working for free. Um, and in, and then Spike brought in Jason Sokoloff, and then Jason Sokoloff brought in Matt Myers to help me really solidify the deal to like, yo, we, can we get this greenlit, please? Because, you know, the script is already ready. And Spike was like, well, let's hurry up, too, because you've been working on the script for such a long time. We've been backwards. And I was broke, too, like, especially because we dealing with student loans and, and other expensive. And, you know, and rent in New York is not cheap. That ran out quickly, so I was dead broke for for a good three months. So I got to um, I got to a point where I was really really broke, and Spike gave me uh, a loan to live off, so I'll be able to focus on the script. And then once I get my first paycheck, I was able to um, pay him back. So we, you know, by May, late May and early June, we finally got greenlit. Um, and we was off to shoot that summer. So, when you- so there was still there was still a lot of work to be done because you know Spike said it got you the deal, but you know it wasn't greenlit yet because you know Netflix was was you know bullshitting a little bit with um, I won't say bullshitting, but there was like they was very much trying to make sure the script is tight, and it was like yo like. <laughs> like the script is fine. Like, you know, what more you want? Like uh-huh. it's here. Let's, let's go. Were there like really big changes that they make? Like when you pitch do people, do they like basically rewrite it or does it still feel like your product? No, we, um, it's me and for Jacob, for Jacob Bailey, my co-writer, um, also from the short to, to the feature. She, we both wrote it. Um, uh, it was, it was a matter of like, okay, are you guys happy with it now? Because we've been happy with it. And it was there was one big change that one executive really wanted to change, uh, and that would throw the script off. And what we trying to do with the script is throw it off. And it was like, nah. And he was pushing, and I had to get Spike on. <laughs> Spike cussed his ass out. So in a pitch, do you did you show them your short as well, or do you just show them the script? No, nah, they saw the short. They saw the short. Um, you know, and Spike gave him the short. Um, I came in and I just explained the vision to the film. Um, and why, you know, what I'm trying to say with, the, with it. And there's a whole, you know, controversy about the ending. I'm just like, oh my God, just people think. So I like for five years, I had to fight for the ending. Oh, that was five your decision years. to put the ending like that. I was not, I was like, wait, where's the rest? I was, I waited for the trailers. I thought it was like an Avengers movie. <laughs> oh, that is funny. I was like, no, that's my like, decision. There's still another part coming. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> nope, there's no there is no part two. <laughs> no part two. I that's the that's I made a very strong choice for the ending. Mm-hmm. And the choice is um I want you know the reason why I want you to um react to it. Because one thing, if I showed her saving a brother and, and you know at all's well that ends well, that'll be a, a an offensive oversimplification of what I'm trying to say about um, police brutality. And if I show her sacrificing herself or if I show another person gets murdered um, through the hands of police or some other black person die, that will not leave the audience, the black audience, the African-American audience with any hope. So I made, I made the audience decide. Mm -hmm. That is the ending. Yeah. When people say there's no ending, I, I you know, it was I find it insulting. Oh no, I, I mean I knew there was an ending. I just kept waiting for more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel you. No, that's fine. That's fine. I don't want to turn it off too soon and then we're talking and you're like, You didn't wait for the for the uh the credits? And we're like, No. <laughs> <laughs> so what uh so okay, so you you have this film now, it's greenlit, it's on Netflix. I mean, I see you're killing it. How, what advice do you have for creatives? Like, how, how does it make you feel that you put in all this work? You were, I mean, you were broke, you were borrowing money, and now something came to fruition. Like, what advice do you have for other creatives who are, like, struggling? Make sure that whatever you're working on, it, it's, it's something that you can fight for um, your life. You can bet your life on it. Um, because 
I, I've i kicked, screamed, I've cried, but I believe, not only myself, but I believe in what I was, the message I want to say, and I believe the material that I was trying to produce, that I was trying to direct. Um, and there was a period where, you know, I hit rock bottom. I thought it was, was, was I didn't want to go anymore, but I, I, you know, through my faith and through a lot of lessons I learned um, through my faith is that it's during that moment where something, there's a breakthrough is about to happen. So keep going because there's a breakthrough is about to happen in your life. Don't stop because you hit rock bottom doesn't mean you're not going to hit diamond. So keep going. That's my biggest advice. It's so funny. Like right when you're giving your advice, there's like this base of a motorcycle behind you. <laughs> I'm like, no. No. <laughs> I know. I apologize. This this is Brooklyn, baby. <laughs> so keep going because your breakthrough is going to happen. So what is what is yes. what is next on your journey? What's your next breakthrough? Um, I'm literally just trying to develop um projects right now. I'm, I'm blessed that Spike wants me to develop an um an old movie that he produced. Um, there's a independent black comic book that's really interesting that I am trying to um develop and i've just been attached to a very good um, action adventure movie so it's in development all this development stuff so we'll see what happens awesome very cool okay so let's quickly jump into the lightning round so the lightning round i'm going to ask you five questions rapid fire you just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind oh shit go ahead you ready <laughs> it's not that hard i'm ready you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> what is the best piece of advice you've received believe in yourself Okay, who inspires you and why? My mother inspires me because she has made a lot of sacrifices for me and and I want to make her proud. Oh, circling back, is she proud of you now, even though you didn't you decided to yes. be a film director? <laughs> she's she's my biggest fan now. <laughs> what, what was the turning point? Like when did she go from I can't believe you're doing this to this is awesome? It wasn't, even, I don't know if it's just, this is Arthur. It's just, just like, she believed in me when I really asked her for like, I need some money mm -hmm. for my thesis and I don't want to take out any more student loans. And she gave me $5,000 and through that $5,000, <clears> through that $5,000, uh, she had to refinance her home. Wow. That's sacrifice. That's cool. What's a habit that's helped you on your journey? Wake up early every day. Like how early? <laughs> sometimes four, sometimes four thirty, sometimes six. Jesus, what do you do that early? I prepare my day. I start writing. Um, and just get my mind right. Mm -hmm. The most successful people wake up very early. Yeah, well, they say the intelligence ones sleep a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's fun. What do you want your legacy to be, Stefan? I want my legacy to be that this man has made some of the most important and uh, profound films that this world has ever seen. I think you're on your way. I definitely do. I mean, for those of you who have not seen See You yesterday, I highly, highly, highly urge you. It's on Netflix. You can check it out right now. Um, any lasting parting advice you have for creatives on their journey, Stefan? Don't fuck up. <laughs> Words to live by. <laughs> hey, if our <laughs> listeners wanted to find you online, where could they find you? It, the best place is Instagram at Stuff on Bristol, plain and simple. And yes, I do reply to my DMs, but just please don't ask me stupid ass questions. <laughs> well, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, thank you. It's an honor. And it was great. It's great to talk to you. After two years, it's really great to talk to you. I'm proud of you. I want you to continue to do what you what you're doing, and um, I see you on the flip side, babe. Yeah, we should start an alumni class because we're going places, kid. We're hell, places. hell yeah! <laughs> well, thank you again. Uh, thank you. Thanks for listening. Stay connected about upcoming resources, including opportunities, festivals, competitions, and grants to help you grow your creative passion by subscribing to my bi-monthly newsletter by visiting funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. 
Don't miss out on a life-changing opportunity and subscribe today at funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. And hey, if you decide to go on Instagram today, follow me. I'm Funny Brown Girl. I'm Shereen Kassam, and you've been listening to Creative Breakthrough. Now, go flex your creative muscle and keep winning.